Today we're going to go over, it is chapter 15 on trauma and stressor-related disorders. Um, we're going to talk all today about PTSD. Oh, it worked for once. It's because you're here. This is the first time I've got it to get full screen in a month. <laughs> all right, so when you guys think of trauma, what comes to mind? How would you define trauma? Maggie, how would you define it? We all kind of know what it is in our head, but it's kind of hard to define. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so run with that experiences. What's What makes a traumatic experience traumatic? Like what makes it... I'm, I'm not, I can't give you that. I keep thinking of the answer here that I'm trying to go for. I can't break away from it. Okay. Okay, fine. Um, Isaiah, how does somebody respond when they experience a traumatic event? Sure. In the moment, later, however you want to go. That. How, how does someone respond when they experience something traumatic? Right. 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 So is being stressed after experiencing a traumatic event, is that something normal or is it something that we would diagnose as a disorder? What what's the defining factor there? Yeah. Affect their daily life. Right. Um, but the first question is stress normal from any traumatic event. Yeah, it's a normal. We've talked about that a lot, how stress in and of itself is a normal body occurrence. You know, when it becomes a disorder is when it affects daily life, when it affects your daily occupations, when you're not able to, you know, function at work or um, not able to attend certain social events because something has, you know, been so traumatizing, you avoid these stressors. OK, very good. All right. So I'm going to read how your book defines trauma. OK. Um, it defines it as a single event, multiple events, or a set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as a physically and emotionally harmful or threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. So it's not just, you know, when we're going to talk about PTSD today, there's a lot of different factors. Um, one thing to remember, remember is that the experience, um, the traumatic experience is very individual and people will see things totally different, um, even to the point of not remembering things or making up things that don't make sense. Um, last year when I taught this lecture, um, I did a lot of research of my own on different people's experiences on 9-11, right? Talking to different people about their experience that you know watching videos people talking about they were there people that um weren't there that were watching at home people that you know caught on later what was happening people that you know had the conspiracy of what happened everybody had a different belief right um 9 11 is one of the biggest conspiracy things that come up and when you know you look at, at research it's because of how traumatizing it is it's that people's brains don't, can't simply wrap around something that is that traumatic. So your brain automatically fills gaps, fills holes of things that might not make exact sense to you. So when talking to somebody about a traumatic event, it's kind of hard to break down of what's true, what is not true, um, because their individual experience may be very, very different. Maybe not even be true from, um, you know, a certain aspect you know i might ask you about how you experienced something and you experienced the exact same thing and it wasn't that bad for you but it was really really traumatizing for you right um there's different types of trauma there's a nat uh, natural trauma and you guys are going to want to know these for your exam too on how to, to differentiate between them um natural trauma is either weather related disease famine human caused accidents um neglect or violent and criminal acts. These are natural traumatic events. Um, then you have intentional trauma. This is where someone um, directly affects you or directly does something to you 
and it tends to have a much stronger effect on the person. So if someone intentionally harms you, tr intentionally causes a traumatic event to you or to your life, that tends to have a much stronger effect on people and the communities. Um, one thing to remember here is that the individual does not have to be the direct recipient of the trauma. And I'm going to keep bringing up 9-11 today because it's something that we all can kind of remember and relate to. Um, people that weren't direct recipients of that still were traumatized by it, right? You know, us, you know, we were not in New York or hopefully we're not in New York, but people outside of the situation still were traumatized by it, right? So it's not just being there and witnessing it. It could be very much watching it or hearing about it or even just thinking about it. It is hot in here, isn't it? Very nice. Let me turn the air real quick. You guys hot or cold? No? You're hot. Well, yesterday we were freezing. We can't find a happy medium around here. I feel like my day was on like 84. Yeah. I, I sometimes I just turn it on. Really? I put it on 65. Oh, no, that's too. Oh, it won't cool down fast enough, believe me. Tomorrow you'll feel the effect. Um, I came in here when I first started. My office was 50, I think I've done 54 degrees. And they kept calling maintenance to come and, you know, find out what was wrong with it. We had our own, uh, we had our own thermostat that was turned all the way down to like 55 or something. Nobody knew that we had our own thermostat. We didn't know it was there. Nobody told me. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Where was that? So, um, polytrauma, that is repeated trauma that um, typically includes injury to body parts or organs. Um, it could be multiple traumatic events. Trauma can be temporary or it can be something long term. It can be mild, it could be moderate, it could be severe. Um, another instance here that um, trauma is uh, thinking outside how it can affect someone that's not directly experienced it is families um you know thinking about like the death of a loved one or you know some of these really bad circumstances like their families are affected indirectly by the traumatic event sometimes as much or not more than the person that experienced it you know um talking about stress so stress in your book is defined as a state of tension causing anxiety or worry Again, this is a completely natural response. This is how your body responds to any stressor. Um, you know, that's, that's normal. Breaking that down a little bit is a stressor is the stimulus that, trig that triggers a stress response. So the stressor itself causes stress. Your stress response is how your body responds to the stressor. Okay, that makes sense? It's just breaking it down a little bit. So you got stress overall. OK, stressor is what causes the stress response. Stress response is how your body responds. The sweating, anxiety, those kind of things. OK. Um, you have different types of stress. You have acute stress. This is stress that happens at a very high stressful or traumatizing event or experience, but the symptoms are short lived. Usually something like muscle tension, headaches, pain, you know, short term anxiety, stuff like that. Then you have chronic stress, and this is definitely going to be a test question, too. So um, chronic stress is repeated and prolonged activation of the stress response. So it's continually going. This is where it gets more severe. This will inter uh, interfere with focus, attention span, memory, mood. Um, not being able to really function at your peak levels. It's, it's affecting how you do your daily occupations. And then lastly is traumatic stress. This is where um, a person is exposed to a traumatic situation or event, and then they become so overwhelmed that they lose their ability to cope. Remember some when we were talking about anxiety in that last group activity that um, our coping mechanisms, this is where it becomes, is so traumatizing your coping mechanisms for normal stress no longer work. Okay. Cool. 
remember us talking about resilience. What is what is resilience, Meredith? What is resilience? Huh? Okay, Jennifer. What's resilience? We've talked about it a couple times. Don't ever think. It. Huh? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I kind of like I think of it of that Rocky movie where that that famous saying like how much you're able to take in and keep on going. That's resilience. So how much stress are you able to take in? How much can you take and keep bouncing back? Keep using your coping mechanisms. Keep going forward. When someone has poor resilience, it makes them at a higher risk of developing some of these disorders we're going to talk about. OK. The first one, any questions so far? Are we good? Cool. All right. So the first one we're going to talk about today is adjustment disorder. This is where someone has a hard time adjusting to stressors. This is where they have poor resilience. They're unable to uh, um, adjust literally by the name of the disorder. They're unable to adjust to stressors. Um, usually um, they're able to tell you what is the stressor, what stresses them out. They are very aware of it. Um, Usually some of the symptoms um, that we're going to talk about last can last days or up to six months. That's extremely important. OK, it can last days all the way up to six months because adjustment disorder and PTSD are extremely, extremely similar. OK, I'm going to try to make that difference between the two. So if I ask you on an exam, you know, how long can uh, symptoms last for adjustment disorder? You would tell me. Up to six months. Very good. Cool. All right. Um, one little side uh, disorder here I want to mention uh, is persistent complex bereavement disorder. This is like after the death of a loved one or whatever um, and having that intense sadness and it's beyond normal. You know, it's completely pulling yourself away, restricting your emotions not being able to function anymore after the death of a loved one. Yeah. All right, so what the cause is of adjustment disorder, normally I say there is no one cause. Well, this one's pretty much caused by stress. This was caused by either non-traumatic or traumatic stress. It can be a single event, or it could be, you know, a wider range of events. It could be even things like divorce, job loss, things that are very short term or long term. This is a very common diagnosis. It's not rare at all. Um, normally the onset is about three months after experience, experiencing whatever stressor caused it. And again, it's after, you know, when it goes above six months, that's when we're talking more about PTSD, not adjustment disorder. OK. All right. Let's talk a little bit about PTSD. So PTSD, as far as diagnostic features, this is going to go beyond that six months. These people are going to avoid triggers and experiences, if at all possible, at all costs. Um, in order that so they don't have this feeling of intense distress. This is beyond like this is a breakdown kind of thing. I've got really good videos for you guys today so you can see it too. Um, the, they're going to avoid even talking about certain experiences and events that happen that cause uh, them to develop PTSD. They're not not going to be very open about it. Um, they're going to have changes in thoughts and patterns. They're going to have irregular mood. They may have outburst and anger, negative feelings of self-worth, um, all the way up to suicidal ideation, suicidal attempts or acts of suicide, anything like that. They may appear, appear what's called hypervigilant or like jumpy. Um, poor sleep function, poor attention span, anxious, irritable, all kinds of stuff. 
if you go to page 215 in your books, there's a really good study tool to help you differentiate between adjustment disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder and acute stress disorder, okay? Page 215, yeah, it's figure 5-1. It's like a little step-down figure, and it'll, it shows you like, PTSD, the onset of symptoms within three months after the trauma and may last for a short time over a lifetime. Okay. And then it breaks it down. Each one is like stepping down almost. Okay. Highly, highly, highly recommend that you review that. Okay. All right. So um, the prevalence is, um, it actually can be uh, diagnosed in children. That was a more um, recent thing. PTSD was not normally diagnosed in children they've just come um, to realize that children can also go through that it was normally diagnosed as something we're going to talk about in a second um, what do you think the cause of PTSD is a traumatic event any kind of traumatic event okay um, it's extremely common in um, people of the military okay um, it puts you at high risk for a lot of different things. You know, victims of rape, people that's been in combat are the two highest um, prevalent in PTSD. There's several factors that go into how someone is going to um, take in or not take in, but adjust to developing PTSD and is going to have a lot to say with outcomes. OK, there's what's called pre-traumatic factors this are these are things that was individual to the person before they experienced the trauma like if they had a bad temper or anger issues prior to experiencing the trauma um, then there's peri-traumatic factors these are things um, that happened during the trauma how traumatizing was the event how large was it how life-changing was it And peri traumatic, P E R I. And then there are post traumatic factors, and this is what type of behaviors are happening after the traumatic event, like the self injurious behaviors or risk taking behaviors, things like that. Um, if that's all going to tie into how their outcome is going to be, how well that they're going to be able to um, adjust with treatment. What are some areas of occupation that you guys can think of that is going to be affected with PTSD? OK, how is work affected? I heard that one first. Lindsay, did you say that? No. How's work affected with someone with PTSD? Um, I mean, work. OK, what is a common trigger we talk we associate with PTSD? Loud noises. That's a big one, right? So how does that affect how somebody can go through and choose a job? They probably wouldn't want like factory work. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just being around kids that are going to yell or scream. Yep. Screaming. People don't even associate that, you know, with loud noises, but screaming is a big one too. Think about combat and screaming. Um, what about like, is there any job you can think of where you can completely avoid loud noises? I mean, think if somebody drops a, a loud box at a fast food restaurant, you know, that could very well be a trigger. That could be a stressor. Um, you know, can you think of a job or an instance or something that somebody could do to completely avoid loud noises? Something to do with yoga. Okay. Very box. Yeah, but in general, that's a quiet, calming environment, right? You're not going to be able to, my point in this is, you're not going to be able to completely avoid stressors, right? Like there's going to be triggers where um, interventions and where treatment is normally focused with PTSD is coping to the stressors, okay? Not having the angry outbursts, figuring out what are the stressors and how we can healthy um, cope with them okay all right 
the next one we're talking about is reactive attachment disorder. This is exactly the opposite of what you think it is. Um, it is where a normally it's children and most 99% of the time it's children. This is where they have a complete disassociation with adults, caregivers in general. This is not attachment to them. This is not wanting to attach to them. Um, this is normally caused by inadequate caregiving, um, you know, abuse, neglect, um, and it results in a heavy, heavy distrust to adults and authority figures. Um, the bonding, a this normally occurs with um, mothers who overwhelmed, those kind of things, um, acts of abuse. This happens when the bonding stage, when a you know infant is learning to trust the mother, that doesn't happen, and then they pull away from all adults. Okay. Some of the diagnostic features is they first have to rule out autism. Autism has to be ruled out first in order to um, talk about um, RAD. No, autism, because the, the way that it presents, and I have a pretty good video of him, of, um, you know, that special books or, or special books written by special kids or something like that. YouTube channel I show all the time or does interviews. He interviews a kid um, and you can show. So a lot of the same symptoms of autism show as, as rat, but autism isn't caused by abuse and neglect. Does that make sense? So it'll present itself as the like nonverbals. Don't touch me, you know, those kind of things. Um, but autism is not caused by abuse or neglect. This is a severe case of abuse and neglect. It's a traumatic, this falls under, you know, the trauma and stressors stuff. This is a traumatic event that doesn't cause autism. Okay. They would probably just be diagnosed with autism. Okay. Wouldn't you think? I mean, well, I wouldn't. That would, I think it's easier on doctors to diagnose autism than it is for them to diagnose RAD. Um, yeah. The defining factor is abuse yeah. and neglect. Yeah, a lot of times the, you see these kids who were adopted from like Russia, um, these Russian orphanages that um, played in an orphanage for a couple of years um, and are adopted to American parents and then they end up developing the Reactive attachment disorder. Kid, those kids can be um, sort of violent. Yeah, they can, and it's not in, and it's because they are so distrusting. They have no bonding attachment at all to caregivers. They don't want to touch. Now, uh, treatment is effective um, with RAD. It is. Um, I'll get to that in just a second. I want to fit the diagnostic features of it is um, must be older than nine months. And symptoms and behaviors have to be present before the age of five. This is something that happens very, very early in, in the child's life. That bonding stage of the mother and the child never happened. Okay, two, they must have two of the following criteria. Okay, there's three. Limited expression of positive affect, so no real positive mood. Next one, or, or I'll slow down, sorry. The next one is minimal emotion and social responsiveness, responsiveness to other people. Okay, the next one's kind of long. It's episodes of unexplained fearfulness, sadness, or irritability that are evident in non-threatening interactions with adults. Or irritability. So this is having a, a extreme fear or stress around an adult when it's not a stressful event, like just the adult trying to bond and play with the child, you know, that not a traumatizing event, and they it's it is to them. Okay. Now, so 
the prognosis or how well do you know kids with um rad how 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 effective is treatment that all depends on how the quality of caregiving is after someone has experienced a traumatic event how well or who are they placed with you know professor hurt brought up the whole adoption aspect from other countries if they're placed into another home that doesn't do well with bonding and you know special attention kind of caregiving their prognosis is not as good but the best treatment is a positive stable loving caregiving home often you know kids recover with it from this disorder it's it doesn't go lifelong if you know proper treatment is done okay is there an age where the treatment would no longer be effective not necessarily because this is something that has to be diagnosed before the age of five so normally those extreme distrusts are are normally gone by that point. And I guess it kind of depends person to person, but again, in order to be diagnosed, it has to be before the age of five. I think if they have a dual diagnosis, um, which a lot of times is what happens with Brad, that sometimes they'll have a diagnosis of schizophrenia or something like that. That that makes it a little more difficult. And then RADs kind of put on the back burner yeah. and they'll treat schizophrenia or something over right. RADs. A lot of times the medications for the schizophrenia won't allow the treatments for RADs to work. Right. Do we have a statistic? Do you understand how many miles have RADs in the It kind of changes later. So the re attachment disorder is completely against caregiving age, like the, the need for constant caregiving, the before age five, younger years. So, you know, what she was kind of saying is that later, they probably will gain a second diagnosis of something and that will be treated and Brad will be put on the back burner. Well, and I've also seen, um, or I've known of kids that are diagnosed with Brad, um, develop conduct disorder mm -hmm. when they get older, which in turn, it, which turns into um, psychopaths so. or sociopaths. Um, so, I mean, it just really depends. Reactive attachment, right? RAD can be treated if diagnosed properly and if the kid has the ability to respond to the treatment. Yeah. But as we all know, there are some kids that just don't respond to any type of emotion or any type of attachments. Um, and it doesn't mean that they don't love the person, right. but they really don't understand what love means because to them, love has always been um, neglect. Right. Or this this um, interview ties really, really well into what she was just saying about um, they do have that sense of love, like they want to be to be loved. And they, you know, generally will say they love their caregiver. They're just, you know, it's a cool video. I'll show you in a second. Um, so what are some areas of occupation that are going to be hindered? Think about younger age occupations. What are you doing at age three, four, five? What's your big goals? Playing, right? What goes into play? Think about elementary school. Friends, relationships, you know, there's it's a distrust, right? So they're going to have a huge issue with making and maintaining friends um, and just participating in play in general, you know. Um, trauma informed care. Anybody have any other questions on RAD? Are we good? Okay. Trauma informed care. This is a, a national and international mental health initiative that advocates for understanding individuals experiencing trauma related care. I don't know why that cut that off. <laughs> okay. Um, again, this is just a huge move trying to understand mental health. And when someone goes through a traumatic event, how you know damaging that can be to someone's mental health and trying to have, you know, a general population understand 
that um, you know we don't need thinking about the military is that we, we you know we bring soldiers home and we expect them after you know being in combat for so long to just roll back into society as normal when that's not what they know now you know um, the VA is really pushing hard now for mental health initiatives for veterans because they're seeing much better outcomes when they come back they go through therapies and early interventions before some of these PTSD behaviors start the angry outbursts the extreme situation uh, or reactions to stressors um, so it, it is getting better and people are becoming more aware of it but um, some little helpful tips tips for you guys um, when dealing with someone that has had a traumatic experience and is dealing with a trauma related disorder I do want you to know these for exam purposes as well okay first one is a key step is it needs to be a safe environment safety is huge they need to be able to feel like it is safe next one is um, trustworthiness and transparency it's a safe environment and now they're able to you know be completely transparent with their emotions next is peer support if requested if they feel you know reaching out a, a lot of times you know in the VA they'll do PTSD help groups and stuff where they can meet with other members of the military and you know talk about things you know maybe not their specific event but talk about their emotions and things that are straight how are you coping and you know bouncing ideas um, another one is collaboration um, between the therapist and the patient making sure that you are like a mutual I'm not higher up than you I'm here trying to understand your situation come up with coping mechanisms next one is being able to empower them giving them a voice and a choice that you know they are the head of their therapy you know they have a choice in what is done and the last one is make sure that you're cultural historical and um, gender sensitive to each situation um, some other big treatments or common treatments are on page 221 Table 15-2, you're definitely going to want to know those. Review them for your exam. A lot of them are stuff that we've talked about several times, the cognitive behavior approach. Um, you know, there's some new ones on there like sensory rooms and things like that. Um, as far as medication goes, some really common ones are um, antidepressants. They'll use for anxiety, depression, stuff like that, people with PTSD. And then a big one, an up and coming one, is medical marijuana. It's becoming more and more common of people, um, you know, being prescribed it for PTSD and other related stressor disorders. It's on our research, evidence-based research, to say that that works. Oh yeah, I'm. It should have been legal yesterday. <laughs> but uh, any questions on these? We're going to watch a video. I've got four videos today. They're all really, really good. I think. You know, listening to somebody who is struggling with PTSD or RAD, or you know, some of the other ones we've talked about is very uh, much eye-opening to see okay
flashback started up again. I'm exhausted. I have PTSD. My service dog saved my life. He gives me unconditional love and reason to live. All right, all right. Go ahead and stop the recording.